The war in Darfur is the conflict the world seems to have forgotten, but it hasn't gone away, and neither has the leader of Sudan, President Omar al-Bashir, the man the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for back in 2009 for alleged war crimes in the region. He was also the first person to be charged by the ICC for the crime of genocide. Bashir, who took power in 1989, is leading a nation that's been grappling with ethnic and religious conflict for more than 50 years, not just in the Darfur region, but also in the south, which eventually led to the division of the country and the establishment of South Sudan. A provisional peace agreement was signed with the non-Arab rebels in Darfur in 2006, and there are talks going on between them and the government to move towards a final deal. But there are still allegations of serious ongoing violence. Recent attacks, including one in September, left hundreds of civilians killed, many of them children, in the Jabal Mara region in central Darfur. This time, the seriousness of the attacks, compounded by allegations that the government went further than at any previous time by employing chemical weapons. We'll discuss these serious allegations, the prospects for real peace, and the role of Sudan's President Bashir as we sit down with Sudan's foreign minister here on Talk to Al Jazeera. Foreign Minister Ibrahim Gandor, thank you for speaking to Al Jazeera. Now, your country has a recent history of conflict. President Bashir has uh, announced a national dialogue. It's been in place for several years now. Tell me how that process is going, because you know there are critics of this process who say, yes, there's a national dialogue, but the government's in control, the government's controlling what is discussed in this conversation. Everybody was free. It has been a free and fair interactive dialogue. Uh, in that dialogue, uh, the number of political parties and uh, rebel groups or ex-rebel groups who participated are many, and that has been witnessed by many visitors to Sudan. One of them, I remember, he said to me very well that this will never happen in another country in the region. You say it's a free and fair process, but just listen to the words of the independent expert for the Human Rights Council. Uh, Aristide Nonosi. He says, notwithstanding the ongoing national dialogue, there's growing concern about the pervasive actions of the National Intelligence and Security Service and their impact on the exercise of civil and political rights in the country. And people I've spoken to have said the same. There's a national dialogue going on, but if you say too much, the security service will be after you. No, tell me about one single politician who's been part of the national dialogue, has been harassed or has been arrested. But remember that Sudan lies in the center of Africa and it has been, it is in fact surrounded by all uh, terrorist groups, Al-Shabaab in the east, ISIS in the north, Boko Haram in the west, southern Sudan with all its problems, Libya, with what is going on, Sudan is still, the government is in full integral, uh, is uh, keeping a full integrity of our boundaries. Khartoum is still one of the safest uh, cities in Africa. That is not, in fact, uh, action without uh, uh, real planning of the security. And if you go back to those who have been in jail or been jailed or now in jail, Sudan is the least country where you'll find someone is being prisoned because of political actions. I can tell you that none is in prison now because of political activity. But human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International say you have an appalling human rights uh, record and even the independent expert who I was quoting earlier say there are major human rights challenges going on uh, in your country right now. Widespread reports of arbitrary arrests and detention perpetrated again by the National Intelligence and Security Service. Uh, I know you say there are security challenges, but are they overstepping their remit? In fact, over uh, the challenges will not be used to harass uh, innocent people. But as I told you that uh, the security challenges sometimes may require some measures to be taken but none of the political activists has never been jailed because of their political activity. 
if you go back to today's newspapers in Khartoum or the day before yesterday or a month back, you will find that those newspapers are criticizing the government, ministers, government institutions, but none of the activists or journalists will be harassed. But some will be accused of other crimes. They are Sudanese citizens and they may be yelled because of that. And then they go back and report to human rights uh, uh, organizations about human rights violations. Well, let me just follow up on that. Why have you been jailing journalists? No, we are not jailing journalists. In fact, I remember very well in Germany, I was asked by journalists like yourself, and he gave me two names, and I was, uh, and I immediately gave him an answer. One of them was accused of a drug uh, problem. The other I didn't know. So there are many cases like that. But if you compare Sudan record of human rights to any other country in the region, you will find that Sudan record is the best. But it's political accusations. But, as you know, there are very strong allegations against your own president. He has been indicted in uh, 2009 for war crimes and in 2010 for genocide by the International Criminal Court. You are a media man. You've been following wars all over the world. Have you ever seen a fight in Darfur? Have you ever seen records of shelling in Darfur? Have you ever seen uh, mass graves in Darfur? I remember very well when some organizations were talking about 500,000 being killed a Sudanese organization counted the graves and compared it with graves everywhere. They found that the number of graves in Darfur as, as average as ever in Darfur, as well as other parts of Sudan. That was a political accusation, in fact, and we know ICC is a political organ of the EU. Everybody knows that this is an, an, uh, a court that has been, in fact, formed and built to indict Africans. And this is why you'll find all uh, uh, those leaders who've been accused or indicted are African leaders. While we see crimes everywhere and nobody is indicting anybody. Certainly your president is now traveling widely. He went all the way to India and he's traveling widely uh, across Africa. Trips to uh, Rwanda, South Africa, Uganda, uh, Djibouti. Is he no longer frightened of arrest? I, I'm not talking about frightened or not frightened. A he nearly got arrested a, a, in South Africa a year ago. No, I was here with him. That is not true. It has been exaggerated by the media, and it has been exaggerated by many. In fact, the president, when there was talk about him being arrested, was he, he was inside the room, delivering his speech to the AU summit. And uh, President Bashir is not challenging the ACC or something like that. He is performing his normal duties as an elected president of Sudan. Do you believe he'll ever appear in court? No, he will never. Because we are not party to the Rome Treaty. And uh, the resolution that uh, refers Sudan to ICC by the Security Council, in fact, at the same time, exempted citizens of other countries. We are not party to the Rome Treaty. According to the Vienna Convention, we are not supposed to be there. Not a single Sudanese will go to the ICC court. The ICC has said that it's suspending its Darfur work. It says it's been frustrated in trying to investigate further. What does that tell you about the court and the indictment against your president? It tells me that now they are quite sure that the indictment was not a correct one. There are, though, still allegations against your country. Those allegations against the president were in Darfur. There are still allegations coming from human rights groups about what has happened in Darfur. The very latest one is coming from Amnesty International, who say they believe there's credible evidence that chemical weapons have been used in the Jabal Mara area from January this year, 30 times, 30 attacks, and most recently on September the 9th. Has your government been using chemical weapons against rebel uh, areas and against civilians in that area? Rebel groups in Jabal Marra are in very few pockets, not exceeding three or four. The other parts of Jabal Marra are inhabited by Sudanese citizens, by our police, by our security, by our army. Chemical weapons don't have a limitation. 
We don't use chemical weapons against our citizens. We haven't used it. If that has ever happened, it is very easy uh, to tell. And I will take you back to the shelling of a Shifa factory, which is in the heart of Khartoum. It has been shelled because they said it produces chemical weapons. How can you shell a factory and shatter it to pieces in a center of a city like Khartoum with six billion people and nobody is dying because of chemical weapons is spreading? That is a big lie because the big brothers are not yet happy with us. But Amnesty say they have proof. They say they've done in-depth interviews with 235 uh, people, survivors. They say they have images and videos of babies and young children, one child screaming in pain before dying. They believe 200 to 250 people have been killed. If that's the case, will you launch an inquiry? Uh, in fact, if that is the case, we will launch an internal inquiry. But I will tell you, whatever happens in Jabal Marra, immediately you name it. We serve Sudan Armed Forces go to the area where the fight was. And it is very easy to verify. We had an evaluation meeting here in New York while I'm here. Everything is going on fine. In fact, we've been talking about how we can hum help uh, with humanitarian assistance some of those affected. And the number was talking about 2,500. And the government took care of that. So nothing of what you are saying is happening. Those organizations are looking for finance. You say that uh, UNAMID can go and investigate, but UN insiders I speak to say that UNAMID asks for permission sometimes to go areas, and your army doesn't give it permission. It doesn't give it permission to go where it wants. You know, this they said that has been happening, but now it is no longer the case. In Jabal Marra, UNAMID has been to everywhere, and there is a tripartite, tripartite committee where SAF, Minister of Foreign Affairs and UNIMIT operate closely together. So let me just be clear on this, because chemical weapons experts who have looked at Amnesty's evidence say they believe the injuries are consistent with blister agents, maybe sulfur mustard, mustard or nitrogen mustard. Do you have such stocks? <laughs> this is a joke, I will tell you. You can bring videos, photographs of everything and tell everybody that this is happening. But the, the reality is that there are inspectors who are not Sudanese, who's been there, and they are right now there, and they can never tell such uh, silly accusations. As well as chemical weapons, as you know, there have been persistent allegations of bombing, abduction, killing, rape, and forced to place the displacement. Amnesty, again, says it has satellite images of 171 villages this year destroyed or damaged. Sudan Armed Forces declared by President Bashir a unilateral ceasefire for the last four months. I don't know where their allegations have been uh, posted. What about the use of cluster munitions? Even the UN Secretary General's report mentioned that you have cluster munitions. You know, I will tell you, these are all lies, even if it has been told by the UN. So the Secretary General, when he writes a report, is lying? Is not true. There are also reports about why the fighting might be continuing in Darfur, natural resources, and one suggestion is the plunder of gold is one of the reasons one of the reasons for the fighting. Is your government benefiting from that gold trade? No. I will tell you that uh, uh, this is also an accusation that came out, and uh, even in the Security Council, where some uh, governments within the Security Council were, were trying to deprive uh, Sudan from its natural resources, including gold, because they think that uh, this will tighten the economic sanctions of our country. In fact, uh, uh, the whole target of Sudan was because of its resources. But right now in Darfur, there is no fight, no rebel groups in Darfur. The Darfurian rebellions are either in South Sudan, uh, fighting as missionaries uh, with the government, okay, the rebel groups, or in Libya. And I'm, I've just, uh, I was just a member of uh, the international contact group with Libya where the Prime Minister of Libya, as Sarraj, mentioned here and in uh, Vienna a few months ago that Jem, 
and Boko Haram, Jem is a Sudanese rebel groups, were fighting with Haftar against the legitimate government in Tripoli. How would you describe the situation for ordinary civilians in Darfur? There are still, I think, 2.6 million internally displaced people, and the UN says 2.7 million people face crisis or emergency levels of food insecurity. In fact, uh, these uh, uh, figures uh, are contradicting with our own figures. We've been asking the UN and all UN organs that we need to report together. And now we have agreed on a joint report on those who need humanitarian assistance. Uh, the talk about uh, displaced people uh, is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, not correct because those people left their villages long ago and they settled in new areas around the towns. Now, new areas around the towns have emerged emerged and people don't want to go back because they adopted new business, their children are in schools, they are getting services. Many don't want to go back. You cannot push them to go back uh, uh, unless they want to go voluntarily. So these are not displaced people. In fact, in reverse, Sudan is the largest country that is receiving refugees in the region, the largest in Africa. You've already mentioned the UN presence in Darfur. It's actually a joint UN-African Union force called UNAMID. Your government has suggested that UNAMID should pack up and go home. Why, if there is still a war, they're still fighting in Darfur, surely the main mission is to protect civilians and they're still needed? Any uh, peacekeeping force, when it comes within the agreement within the government and the UN and any other stakeholders, there is an agreement on the exit strategy. Three years ago, we requested to start on the exit strategy of UNIMIT from Darfur. A tripartite uh, group was formed for a whole year, and after one year, when the group itself from the UN and AU and the government of Sudan said that it is time to start an exit strategy and to cut the number of soldiers, police and civilians working for UNIMIT should start the government, the UN headquarters reversed the issue and they came in UN Security Council with what they called new benchmarks in order to reverse and turn the batch that has been, uh, that has started already on the exit strategy. Last year we had a meeting, we agreed to continue from where we stopped. We had three meetings now and we had a, an, a, a, in fact an investigation mission went to Darfur and they said that we can start an exit strategy from some parts of some areas of Darfur because there is peace right now in Darfur. So this is an agreed upon exit strategy. It is not new, but there are some who are interested to see UNIMID is staying. Uh, UN spends on UNIMID annually 1 billion and 300 million US dollars. If that is given to the government of Sudan, it could have changed the whole of Darfur into not only a peaceful settlement, but it has, in fact, uh, abolished the reasons of the fight, which is drought. There are other areas in the world which need peacekeepers. If that money has been used elsewhere, that is what we decide, what we propose to the UN. So it's an agreed upon strategy. It is not our own request. It is what we want, and it is in the book of agreement on UNIMED deployment. Of course, Darfur is not the only place where there is conflict in your country. There is also what is known as the two areas, Blue Nile and South Kordofan. As you've already mentioned, there is supposed to be a ceasefire for four months, that is coming towards the end. And even that has not been fully respected. There has been violence, you probably accept that. What happens if you don't get talks going again? In fact, uh, today we had, uh, we agreed with uh, the panel that the talks will start in the coming few weeks. An invitation may come to the two parties any time. And we hope that we reach a cessation of hostilities. As you know, the government signed the roadmap. The rebel group signed five months later. We hope that this will pave the way for cessation of hostilities, security and political talks, and we hope to end the conflict. We are much closer than ever, 
and we hope that this will end the conflict in the two areas. But I can tell you, in Blue Nile right now, there are no rebel groups. They are on the borders. There are no fight there. And within uh, Jabal, uh, within uh, South Kurdufan, the areas are very much limited. But still, we believe that there is no solution but a political solution. Let me move across the border now to what used to be part of your country, now an independent nation, South Sudan. How worried are you about the situation there? Tens of thousands of people have been killed, more than a million refugees, and I know some of them are in your country. Not only some, 75% of them are in our country. And that can tell you whether Sudan is peaceful or not. Because the areas we're talking about are our, on our borders with South Sudan, and nobody will move from an area where there is a fight to an area which is insecure. Uh, but we are very much worried because uh, we believe that there is no peace in Sudan without peace in South Sudan and vice versa. Uh, when we agreed on the referendum and the separation of South Sudan because we are between, trying to choose between one nation living in peace or two countries living in peace. And this is why whatever happens in South Sudan will affect us directly. Give me your personal opinion. Uh, Minister, having followed this issue for so long, now you see the bloodshed in South Sudan. Did the people there make a mistake voting for independence? Not the people there, but those who pushed them to make that voting did a mistake. We've been telling the Americans, the EU, everybody that uh, separation of South Sudan uh, may be a premature decision. But we respected the decision of our brothers and sisters. That is an agreement uh, in 2005 to be honored. We honored our commitment. And in fact, we see that this is now going on the wrong path. We are quite sure that our brothers in the South can do better with the help of everybody in the region. We with IGAD are doing our best to achieve that. I'm sure peaceful in South Sudan will come also. As you know, it's sort of developing in places into a tribal conflict. At the center of it are two men, President Salva Kiir and former Vice President Riek Mashar, who now finds himself in Khartoum. You are sheltering him. Are you actively supporting him? In fact, uh, it will be an oversimplification of the issue if you talk about two men. It's a political issue that turned into a tribal conflict. When the two largest tribes in an African country are fighting, the issue is serious. But we are still working to see that things are moving better. Mashar has been uh, recovered uh, from the forest in the Democratic Republic of Congo after walking for 48 days. It, uh, he has been recovered for humanitarian reasons as well as political reasons. It was an IGAD decision in Nairobi, in Kigali, at the AU summit, as well as in Addis Ababa, that Mashar is important for peace in South Sudan. But it's still Mashar in Khartoum for treatment, and he is leaving Khartoum very soon. Khartoum will not be used as a springboard to, for any military action against the government of South Sudan. I stated that very clearly yesterday because observers believe that Uganda is helping President Keir militarily. The suggestion is you might start helping former Vice President Mashar, and what is a conflict in South Sudan could turn into a regional conflict. It will never happen that way. We received Mashar on Friday the 19th, and we received Ferris Vice President Tabanding on the 22nd. The government of South Sudan knows very well and we, it has been informed immediately after we received the former vice president and the international community knows that very well and we are liaising with IGAD as well as with other African dignitary leaders. Mr. Foreign Minister, my final question. Your country is a place that has seen a great deal of conflict in recent history. Do you see a brighter future for Sudan? Yes, if a country was capable to stop the longest war in Africa, we are capable of reaching a final peace. We are much nearer than many expect. We are, in fact, 
on the shores of a peaceful settlement for everything in Sudan. I can see a better future for the coming generation. Foreign Minister Ibrahim Gandor, thank you for speaking to Al Jazeera. Thanks, I enjoyed talking to you.